Hi everyone, thanks again for joining us today. My name is Siri de Volaga. I'm a pre-sales engineer here at Exclusive Networks. And today I will be your host for this expert session. We will talk about FIDO and MFA. We will start from the ground, so don't worry. A brief introduction regarding to security. We'll move on to actually what is identity and information security. We'll tackle some terms such as OTP, second factor, multi-factor, and then we'll move on to FIDO and I will actually show you how FIDO works and how you can use FIDO at home. If you are not familiar with Exclusive Networks, we are a cybersecurity distributor. We focus on value add. So we have a whole bunch of different services that we offer to our partners. We also are authorized and uh, authorized training center as well as authorized support center for a couple of vendors. As I mentioned, I'm a pre sales engineer here at Exclusive. I joined pretty recently, like nine months ago. And I'm mainly responsible for Palo Alto Networks, Dallas, Axonius, as well as Netscope. And today it's a real pleasure to be here and talk to you about FIDO and MFA. So let's kick off and show you the agenda of today. As I mentioned, we'll start from the ground. And at the end of this session, I will show you a demo as well. And my call to action today is actually hopefully learn a bit more about information and identity security and hopefully show you how easy FIDO it is and why you should definitely use FIDO at home, but also in your organization. So let's kick off this webinar. And first of all, let me ask you a question. Do you think that security is something new? And what I mean with new is like, does it exist for 20 years, 50 years, 100 years? And actually try to think about it. Is security implemented the same way in your organization as at your own? No, I don't think you. So at home, usually we are using less security or we are less protected. However, if we think about information and data, hopefully we all know that both in an organization as well as at our own, at our home, from a personal point of view, we all have information, we all have data. So how do you protect your credentials? And in fact, let me talk to you a bit more about security. Security is not something new. It exists for many years, even 100 years, if not 1,000 years. If we take a look at this castle, for instance, it's a perfect example of what we call defense in debt approach. So the idea is that we will not rely on only one security solution or one security layer. We'll have multiple of them. And that's exactly what happened in today's organizations. We have multiple single point solutions that usually do not integrate well with each other, uh, but all those different single point solutions will represent our entire defense strategy. And today, when we think about security, we think about securing and protecting our crown jewels. So what do we mean with crown jewels? Well, today we usually refer to information, data about your organization, think about intellectual property, but also information data regarding to your people. Think about your employees, your partners, your customers, etc. So you want to make sure to be able to protect information and identity. Well, let me tell you something that's absolutely not easy. And one of the key challenges here is in fact, as I mentioned, all those single point solutions, but also the fact that your attack surface is becoming bigger and bigger. We all use cloud applications today and we need to stay ahead from new attacks as well, because as we'll see, attackers and hacker groups are very good uh, at finding new ways, new methods to actually compromise users, compromise information and identities. So security is not something new. It's something really hard to implement because there are a couple of challenges. And of course, I don't want to bother you too much with all the security challenges. I just want to highlight one of them digital transformation. And when we think about digital transformation, we all remember the shift from HTTP to HTTPS. So all the web traffic is now encrypted. So from a security point of view, that's a challenge. We need to be able to decrypt the traffic to gain visibility. Suddenly everyone started using the cloud. Everyone used cloud applications. Developers are also um, creating their applications, hosting their workloads in the clouds. And then of course, the language of the internet, the language, how you communicate with all those applications and services has changed. And you need to actually learn every day 
to keep up with all those changes. And then last but not least, we also saw the effect of the pandemic where suddenly everyone started working from home, from vacation, from another country. So we have the introduction of what we call mobile users. Now, maybe one of the most important challenges here is in fact, from an attacker point of view, it's also referred as proliferation of attacks. So first of all, we have more attacks, we have more targeted attacks, and the attacks are more complex. And you will see as well that hackers or attackers are using all the tools they have, such as automation, AI, and hackers also know that organizations try to secure themselves against those type of attacks. So what attackers are focusing today is finding new ways, new ways to actually bypass existing security solutions. And this is really important. Attackers today are focusing on you. They want your identity. They want information that you have. They want your permissions, your privileges. They want to access the assets that you can manage. And that's really important. Also, keep in mind that attackers today are no longer to alone. They are working with other groups and attackers. They are forming an, an alliance in some way to actually target you. But in most of the cases, they actually target your identity, your information to then target someone else, an org another organization, one of your friends, one of your family members. And that's typically called spear phishing. Spear phishing is the idea where you gain information about the person you want to attack, and then you actually use that information to make sure that that particular people will definitely click on the link you send him to email, for example. So we talked a lot about identity and information, and in fact, MITRE has very good defined it under different tactics and uh, attacks that are possible. And one of the names that MITRE has defined is gather victim identity information. So if you want to learn more about that, please go to the MITRE uh, website. You will see all the techniques, all the procedures and some examples as well. And today I just want to highlight some of examples of breaches regarding to identity information. On my left hand side, we can see the example of OPM, so the US Office of Personal Management, where 4.2 million records of their employees were stolen. In 2015, Uber actually missed one of their pages on GitHub, so there was a page on GitHub publicly available, and there was actually a password on that page. So one of the users actually used that password to get into the database and exfiltrate data, as easy as it sounds. And actually, after that, Uber attacked GitHub to say, hey, look, give me all the IP addresses that were used. And of course, GitHub says, no, no, no. So again, make sure that all the information that you are posting online, that you verify what information you are posting online. Because if you create a page publicly available for anyone and you put a password on it, yes, of course, you will be breached. But another example as well uh, on the right hand side is millions of emails and passwords were dumped in an 87 gigabyte file. So this is a perfect example of what we call a scalable attack. What do we mean by that? Well, if an attacker can compromise a server and he managed to actually exfiltrate one password, one credential, it will cost him the same effort to actually steal all of the passwords and all of the credentials that are stored on that server. And that's the example that we can see here. The attacker did not stole one password. He stole 87 gigabyte of emails and password. That's just enormous. So again, keep in mind, warning here, all the information that you put online, if it is on social media, if it is in your cloud environment, whatever, can be used by attackers to gain information about you, but also about your environment. And that's something that usually is forgotten uh, in today's environments. Another call to action that I want to share here with you is the website of Unit 42. So Unit 42 is the Threat Intel team of Palo Alto Networks. And here we can see a list of different ATOMs, so actionable threats, objects, and mitigations. What's nice about this website is you can filter down based on the industry as well as the location. So for instance here, the Black Cat ransomware, uh, you can see all the information regarding to that attack. What are the indicators of compromise? You can see how many campaigns have been run, as well as the industries that are targeted and different regions um, affected by that attack or campaign. And then at the bottom of this slide or at this uh, tool, you will also find the mapping towards the major attack framework. So as you will see from, for example, here for the Black Rat uh, ransomware, we had some reconnaissance, initial actions, 
persistence, etc. And just for information, this attack is actually possible because there was no identity security, no second factor, no multi-factor, and of course, no FIDO in place. This is a really important one. If you go to Unit 42, as well as the FIDO Alliance website, you will find a whole kind of information, different blocks, uh, white papers as well, regarding to new attacks and new techniques used by attackers. Uh, it's really important to keep ahead with this new type of attacks because if you don't know what's going out there, you can protect yourself. And um, this is really interesting because it's a report uh, or white paper done by Palo Alto Networks uh, regarding to cloud security. And the conclusion um, of this report was actually that the first line of defense regarding to cloud security is identity security. Because, of course, all those users, all those administrators need to access your cloud uh, environments, need to access your workloads, need to manage them. And that's typically something you want to have control of. Okay, so we told a lot about the identity and information. Let's focus a bit more on the technical point of view and take a look at how we can secure information in the first place. And again, I just want to ask you this question. How do you secure your information? And take a moment to think about it at your office, your work environment, and how do you secure information at your home? Is there a difference between them? And kind of a small giveaway here. I will talk about encryption. And when we think about encryption, you should think about it the same way at your home. When you are sitting at home and you go to work, for instance, the first thing that you will do is verify that every window is closed. And then when you move uh, to your work, you will make sure that you close your door and you will use what? A key for that. So you go to work, you come back to your home, and then to actually get in your home, you use that same key to unlock the door. So encryption is kind of the same logic here. So we will use a key to actually lock and unlock our data, our information. Encryption is part of cryptography and is actually a study um, of finding new techniques, new methods to make something that's readable, data that's referred as plain text, something that you can read, and make that unreadable. And when I say unreadable, I mean unreadable, human unreadable, but also computer unreadable. That's the main goal of encryption. And that's really important because data can move between different phases. We have what we call data at rest, data in use, and then data in motion. Data at rest is data that resides on a disk store, but that's not being used. Data in use, however, is data that resides on a disk store, but is being used. For instance, my PowerPoint presentation here. And then data in motion, that's typically data that you will send from one location to another over a network, for instance. And it's important to keep in mind, because we have all that data in different phases, that we need to be able to protect data going from one phase to another. That's where encryption will help us. So the main goal of encryption is actually make data that's referred as plain text readable to make that unreadable, that's referred as encryption. And then most importantly, you must be able to reverse that process. So you need to be able to make data that's unreadable, readable again. And that's called decryption. There are two things that are important here. When you use encryption and decryption, there is in fact an encryption algorithm being used as well as a key. Let's talk about those keys. We have two types of encryption. The first one is referred as symmetric encryption. With symmetric encryption, you only use one key. Let's take a look at an example. I'm sitting here at home and I want to send some data to my colleague that's at the office, for instance. So data that reside at rest on my computer will now be sent over the network to my colleague. If I want to make sure that that data is encrypted using symmetric encryption, I will use one key to encrypt that data, send that data over to my colleague, and then my colleague would need that same key to be able to decrypt that data. So this is typically the story that I told with, uh, with your home where you unlock or, uh, lock or unlock your door with your key. Same principle here. However, we have a problem because both sides are using the same key. If my colleague lose this key, that key gets compromised, well, attacker is now able to decrypt all my traffic. So it's not a very secure way. However, it's a very scalable or performant uh, way to encrypt data. What I mean by that is it does not require a lot of computational power and it's very fast to execute. 
However, it's not that secure. The less or better method to use is asymmetric encryption. So instead of learning one key, you will have two keys now. And by the way, asymmetric encryption is also referred as public key encryption. So the goal here is that we have a public key that's of course publicly available, and then a private key that should of course be kept private, secret. So let's take a good look at the same example. I'm sending a file from my home to my colleague, but instead of using one of my keys, I will use the key of my colleague. And more particularly, I will use the public key of my colleague to encrypt the data that I'm sending to him over the network. My colleague receives that data and he's the only one that can decrypt that data because he's the only one that has a private key associated to that public key. So one thing that's important to keep in mind here is that a public key and a private key are always mathematically linked with each other. It doesn't matter if you are using a public key for encryption or a private key for decryption, as long as you are using different keys for encrypting and decrypting traffic, and that those keys are, of course, a pair, so they are mat mathematically uh, linked with each other. So why is asymmetric encryption much more secure? Because we are using different keys. So my side uh, is using different keys than my colleague. And in addition to that, we do not rely on one key, we have two keys. Okay, you will make sense, and hopefully it will make sense why I'm talking about public key cryptography at this point, because we will talk about FIDO and how to secure your identity, and we will come back to that public key cryptography. So for now, let's move on to how we can secure identity. And before we do so, let me ask you one more question. What do you think about passwords? Do you think a password is a good way to authenticate? Do you like passwords? Because I hate them. And it's not a problem for me to enter a password when I'm sitting on my computer. But at the moment I'm logging in on another device, on a mobile device, yeah, I need to look at my password. I need to type it on a small device. And yeah, I don't like it. And I often hear people saying, hey, look, my password is very, very secure because I only use characters and it's like 36 characters and only symbols. So impossible for a hacker to actually breach my password and i would say okay fine great you have a nice password but let's take a look at how authentication process uh, exists today when you log in or authenticate through a server what will happen typically you use username and password but what users or people always forget is that that password need of course to be stored somewhere and usually that password will be stored on a server if you are using a password manager, well, that's an attack surface uh, as well. But the passwords will be stored on the server. And as I mentioned previously, the kind of a type of scalable attack that uh, attacker groups are using today is in fact targeting those servers where they know all those passwords, all those credentials reside. And that way, they can just exploit with all the credentials at once. And now your username and password is breached. You maybe don't know it. So if you don't know, um, or if you never made the test, please go to Have I Been Found to verify that your username and password uh, has not been breached recently or even in the past. But just keep in mind, an attacker will always try to uh, compromise a server instead of your client because that server will contain a whole bunch of more information, more credentials um, about more people. So. Username and password, a good idea, I don't know. Typically you use it to register, you use it to authenticate, and as I mentioned, you use it on multiple devices as well. So let's take the example of Facebook, you provide username, password, and click on logging. And before you even know you have been fished, because yes, we know we need to be kind of suspicious about everything received in our mailbox, we need to check every link, we need to always check the URL at the top, and in this example we can see it is definitely a phishing page. But you might forget about something, you might think, okay, it's Facebook, everything looks the same, I just provide username and password. And in worst case, you don't even know you have been phished, and that's really a danger one, because if you don't know you have been phished, your password is um, known by the attacker, 
and you don't know it. So maybe three weeks afterwards, your boss will be coming at your office, at your desk and start yelling at you because suddenly your account has been used in Indonesia to exfiltrate 87 gigabytes of emails and passwords. So you want to make sure to have a secure way to authenticate and register as well to make sure that you are not vulnerable against phishing attacks. So what did we do? Well, we actually came up with what we call second factor authentication. And one of the well-known examples about second factor is OTP, a one-time password. So we are using an external solution to actually generate a password that's usually only available for 60 seconds. Um, but we have a problem. That password is generated, but we need to have access to that password. We need to enter that OTP online as well. So if we have a man in the middle attack, if we have a phishing attack that's going on, well, the attacker basically sees your OTP. In addition to that, you might know that attackers, it's really easy for them to actually access your mailbox, even to access your SMS uh, conversations. And as you might know, today we have some authentication applications, so applications that are running on your mobile devices that can be used to generate such OTPs. But the problem with that is that hackers can make use of unknown vulnerabilities to exploit those and then gain access to your operating system of your mobile device. And then the application that's running on top is just accessible for the attackers. So they are able to log into the application, see what's going on, and of course, gather that OTP. So one-time password, it's a good way to secure your environment, but it's not the best one because once again, attackers can actually gain access some way to that OTP. So on the right hand side, we can see some software uh, solutions that we have for OTPs, but we also have some hardware solutions, such as on the left side, the SafeNet OTP uh, 101 token. We also have e-tokens, smart cards that can be used uh, to authenticate using a certificate or using that, once again, one-time password, usually six or eight digits that are randomly generated. So a second factor authentication, it's a good way to protect our accounts, but as we saw, it's not the best. So we introduced multi-factor authentication. So instead of having just username and password, you might have an OTP as well. And then on top of that, you would have something you have, something you are even, such as your bio biometrics. I just want to highlight here that for my case, for instance, when I do need to log into uh, my single sign-on dashboard to access some of my uh, corporate applications, well, I need to provide a OTP. However, that OTP can only be um, actually accessed from my device if I present my fingerprint. So I have an additional layer of security. I just want to highlight here that recently, uh, China's re China. Chinese researchers, sorry, has revealed, uh, revealed a zero-day vulnerability on Android devices that allows him to actually brute force fingerprints. So he's able to actually kind of perform a man-in-the-middle attack to then gather your fingerprints. So think about it. Your biometrics can also be uh, vulnerable or exploited uh, in those kind of attacks. So, of course, we need a new and a better way to authenticate. And as I mentioned previously, there are all kinds of other methods, such as uh, using certificates. And one of the actual methods that's being used is using public key cryptography. So here the idea is that we have a private key that's stored on the client on the left side, and we have a public key that's stored on the server, the server that you want to authenticate to. So what will happen here is you try to authenticate to that server, the server will send you some messages and all that data that you receive from the server, you will actually encrypt that data with your private key. And you will send that over to the server again. And the server, because it has a public key associated to the private key, and you should be the only one that has the private key, the server is now able to authenticate you. It guarantees that you are the people or the, the user you uh, are telling the server. So we have one problem here. I don't know if you saw it, well, the private key is on the client. So once again, if the attacker compromised the operating system of that client, if the attacker managed to deploy some malware, some spyware on that client, well, game over. 
is able to access your private key, is maybe able to exfiltrate your private key. So the whole benefit of private and public key just falls away. So we definitely need a new way to authenticate and that's exactly what FIDO and FIDO2 uh, will provide you. So what's FIDO? FIDO is an alliance and as Wart mentioned in the last session as well, it stands for Fast Identity Online. The goal of FIDO is pretty simple. Create a simple, stronger authentication process. FIDO has been launched in 2013. It's an alliance and you can see on the top right of my slide, um, there are a whole bunch of different organizations and companies that join the alliance. Big names such as Microsoft, Apple, Visa, Thales, and so on. And if you take a look at the evolution between 2013 and today, so we are 10 years afterwards, we have more than 800 FIDO certified products. We have over the 4 billion devices that do support FIDO and FIDO2, and we have over 150 million people that try to move to passwordless solutions every month. So, as I mentioned, FIDO has simple goal, make it easy for the user and provide best-in-class secure authentication. How will FIDO do that? Well, it will use public key cryptography. And the last thing I want to share with you about the FIDO Alliance is that today, in 2023, we have actually all the platforms that are supported, so you do not have any excuse to not use FIDO or to not activate FIDO, even from a personal point of view. So we always focus on the organization, um, but you, as a personal people, at your home, you can actually use FIDO to secure your social media accounts, to secure your mailbox, and so on and so on. So it's cross-platform, and you can also use it to actually unlock your devices, and even mobile devices today are supported. So let's talk about FIDO. So remember this, I told about the private and public key, but here the only issue is that a hacker can access the client to steal that private key because the private key is stored on that client. So what's FIDO doing? FIDO is actually taking that same principle, so private public key, so public key cryptography, but instead of having that secret key, your private key, stored on the client, it will be stored on a small security key. And let me show you that. On my left hand side, I have a regular USB key, and this is actually a FIDO key. So it's same look and feel really small, simple to use. The only difference is, I don't know if you can see it, but at the uh, backwards of that key, you have a single, uh, like a small pin, and if you touch it, it will actually uh, sign a request. So the whole principle of such a FIDO key is that whenever you want to authenticate or register, whenever you want that key to sign something, you will need to touch it physically. And that's of course not something that a hacker can simulate from remotely, you know? So that's the, the real benefit of this security key. That's, of course, removable. So if you go at home, you simply take that key with you. On that security key, you will have your private key that's stored, and that private key will actually be used to sign your request. So basically, data that will be received from the server will be encrypted, sent over back to the server, and the server will be able to decrypt that data, and that way it guarantees that you are the people you pretend to be. So we have a couple of um, components involved in FIDO. So on the right hand side, we have what we call a relying party, also known as RB. And it's just a server. It's the server that you want to authenticate to, relying party. Then we have the platform authenticator. We have a whole bunch of platform authenticators supported today. And then of course your client. And your client has your web browser typically that's uh, running on top of that. And in your web browser, you are trying to access an application, uh, social media, for instance, uh, GitHub, et cetera, et cetera. And your goal is, of course, to be able to register, but also authenticate using that FIDO key. So let's talk a bit more about FIDO and FIDO2 and how it works. So first of all, we need to tackle some terminology. And I don't want to bother you too much with details regarding to protocols, but we have some protocols that are being used by FIDO, of course. So if you think about FIDO and FIDO2, by the way, the main difference between FIDO2 is, of course, FIDO exists for a long time, so they had made some changes. And FIDO2 actually refers to kind of the container of all web, um, web protocols being used for authentication. So the first protocol that we have, and you might be familiar with that, is U2F, Universal Two-Factor Authentication. 
And U2F has recently been renamed to CTAP1, which we send for client to authentication protocol. And the goal here is that CTAP1 or CTAP2, CTAP2 is basically used in the FIDO2 protocol, um, is to actually being able to, with your client, access your security key, your private key, and being able to sign that request, encrypt the data, and send it over to the server. To be able to communicate with the server, you will need an additional protocol that's called WebAuthN. So U2F is basically used between your web browser and your security key. And then we have WebAuthN, which is used between your platform authenticator and your server. UAF and U2F. So again, I don't want to bother you with too many acronyms here, but we have UAF, which is kind of um, a universal authentication framework where you can specify which second or multi-factor authentication methods you want to use. So for instance, you want to use a biometric, fine, you can use a biometric using UAF. U2F, universal two-factor uh, authentication, will actually allow you, such as in this example that we saw with FIDO, to log in with a username and password and then use a security key to actually press that security key and guarantee your registration or authentication process. So let's take a look at that in much more detail. So when we think about FIDO, we have two things that are important, registration process and the authentication process. So first of all, let's talk about registration. So I think we all uh, know how to register to a new application, a new social media uh, platform. So the first thing we do is we click on register an account, we provide username and password, and we have an account that's set up. The second thing you will need to do is actually, and that's kind of my recommendation, is provide a second factor authentication. Why should you do that? Well, in case of you lose your key or in case something went wrong, you need a backup authentication method. So here you will typically use an OTP, uh, your SMS, uh, your phone number to receive an SMS, but this is really in the worst case. So once you have username and password configured, you have a second factor authentication uh, set up on that service. Well, you will now register your FIDO key, your security key. And how you do that? Well, you basically click on a button where it will be uh, asked to add a security key and the server will now send you over a challenge. So that challenge is basically a random string. Of course, we have a whole bunch of other information that's sent from the server to the client. But to keep it high level here, the client will now take that challenge, take that app ID, and add one last thing, which is the origin. What is the application that you are trying to authenticate from your web browser? Yes, you have your client, your web browser, server is sending the app ID, but you want to make sure that the web browser you are using, seeing before your eyes, is the same as the app ID you received from the server. If it is not the same, well, typically uh, this will be a man in the middle attack. So that's the way how we can prevent against uh, man in the middle attacks. And then, of course, that challenge will be sent over to your security key, and your security key will perform what we call a key handle. To be able to actually perform that key handle, you will need to touch your key physically. If you do not touch it physically, the key handle won't, um, yeah, won't happen. The key handle will basically generate a key pair. That key pair will also have a key ID assigned. So that way we know that, okay, this key is assigned to that private and public key. What will happen next is the private key will be used to encrypt some data, all the data that received from the server, as well as some metadata, and will also pass the public key, of course, to the server. And the server will be able to verify the payload, verify our identity, because the server now has the public key and is able to decrypt all that data. And the server will verify the payload, so it will again verify the challenge. Is the challenge the same? Is the app ID the same? Is the origin the same? Et cetera, et cetera. So that way we are sure, or now our server has a public key with a key ID assigned for a specific user, and we can guarantee that that user is the people or the person we who we pretend to be. So we talked about registration. Let's talk about authentication. And you will see it's it will make sense once we talk about authentication. So when we try to authenticate to a service, again, username and password. But at the moment we provide that to the server, the service will the server will go like, oh, 
I do remember you had a security key. And the way he is remembering that is because he has a public key with a key ID assigned to that specific user or that user account. So the server will now send over a challenge again to the client. So the challenge is a random string, remember? We also send a whole bunch of other data and metadata that's uh, used for security reasons, but we'll talk about that later on. So the challenge is sent to the client, app ID is sent to the client, a whole bunch of other information, and the client now needs to actually use his security again, security key again. So he will touch his security key, this will sign the challenge, the app ID and all the information, and then the client will send that encrypted data back to the server. The server has the public key that should be associated to the private key and is able to decrypt all that data. And it will, of course, again, verify the app ID, verify the challenge and verify the origin because otherwise something might be wrong. There might be a man in the middle attack or there might be uh, a phishing attack going on as well. Let's talk about some of the parameters that has been added in the protocol to make sure that no man in the middle attack and no phishing um, attacks are possible. And also make sure that someone can not just take your key, take a clone of your key and then it's good to go. So one of the things that's been added is called a counter. So the idea of the counter is that whenever the user is requesting a registration or authentication challenge, the server will send out the counter as well. So imagine the counter is set to five, five sent to, to the client. The client needs to um, add a plus one to that counter because he will now sign that request. So if it was five, the counter will go up to six and the client will send six over to the server. And because the server know that the first time it sent it out, it was five, five plus one is six. So we are good with the counter. However, if someone takes your key, clones your key, put it in his device and try to authenticate or register, you will see that that counter will not be the same. So that way our server knows, okay, there is a clone somewhere. It doesn't know what key is a clone. It just knows, okay, I have two keys that are being used, but they have a different counter. So that way we are able to block that key. Hopefully that makes sense. And again, there are a whole bunch of other information that's being sent over. Most importantly is the app ID and origin that's used against man in the middle attack and the counter, as I mentioned here, that will be used to prevent actually someone from cloning your security key. Okay, so what happens if you lose your key? Well, as I mentioned, if you have a second factor authentication already enabled, uh, and I hope you do, because if you only rely on username and password, well, all the benefits of your FIDO again falls away. But if your key is compromised, you lose your key, whatever, you simply have to block that key, fall back to another authentication method. And that's the reason why I highly recommend you to always have two keys. So we can see here the key that I'm using every day to authenticate and another one that I call my backup key. So usually that backup key should be stored and kept secure in a safe, for instance. Um, so if one day I lose my key, they stole my key, I always have a backup key. Okay. And typically also there's the advantage of having an EIM solution in an enterprise organization that you can kind of automate all those things, have nice visibility on what keys do I need to revoke, what keys need to be replaced. But usually you want to make sure to have uh, the possibility to add a backup key, so a second security key in case of. Okay, that was a whole bunch of information. Uh, if there are any questions, please drop them in the chat. I will do my best to answer them. And otherwise we'll continue with kind of a demo. So because it was all kind of very abstract, let's take a look at that in action. The first thing I want to do here, and please go to that website, it's called webavn.io. You will find a whole bunch of information if you want to implement FIDO on your own because I didn't talk about that. Usually FIDO will be used for your mailbox, for your social media accounts, for your enterprise apps. But if you are a developer, if you are creating an application, you can also implement FIDO. So you will need, of course, to implement FIDO from both sides, from the client point of view, as well as the server point of view, but you will be able to find all the information on webout.io. So specific client libraries, and uh, of course, GitHub is your best friend. Open source um, information that's available there can be pretty useful. Another thing that you can do on webhouse.io is actually verify that entire 
uh, FIDO process. So just to show you an example of um, some libraries and codes that's available here on webadn.io. For instance, the Python library, if you do click on that, you'll be redirected to the GitHub page. They are very well documented, so you will always have a readme file with clear instructions as well as the prerequisites. Um, so yeah, very well documented. Make sure to take a look at that if you want to integrate FIDO in your own applications. Next, you are able to actually test uh, one of your security keys, and that's pretty nice because you can see everything we talked about, the challenges, the IDs that are exchanged, the uh, origin and app ID, you'll be able to see that in action. So the first thing that we will do is, of course, use web out and to register a new user. So what I will do here is basically provide a username. No password this time, just a username for demo purpose, demo purpose and I will click on register. Then I will have this nice pop-up that um, comes up and it's asking for a pass key because in fact FIDO2 today has evolved. We also have pass keys and a pass key is in fact a simple way to use the same FIDO2 experience without your FIDO key. So at this moment in time when I clicked on the register, I was logged in in my browser, my Google Chrome browser with my Google account. And here I'm actually able to select my smartphone that's also connected with that same account. And I could use my smartphone to unlock um, or to provide the authentication. So what does that mean? You hopefully all know that a smartphone should be protected with a password or maybe with your fingerprint. Well, the fact that you are able to unlock your smartphone, unlock your device with a PIN or with the biometrics, that's enough uh, in the final process to make sure that you are the people or the person we, uh, who you pretend to be. So just to mention here that you can also use other devices as well and you do not rely to have that uh, security key. Of course, I highly recommend you to have a FIDO security key. It's better. Uh, and if you do so, please always have a backup key as well. It's much more secure. So we can authenticate via a smartphone, we can authenticate via a device as well. So instead of using uh, my uh, smartphone, my Samsung, I could also use my local device. So in my case here, I'm running on the MacBook. So I could perfectly say, hey, look, authenticate with this device. I need to create a user. Here by default, it will be the same username as the one that I entered to register. And then I actually need to provide my biometrics on my MacBook to guarantee that I'm the person who I am. But of course, and that's the one uh, we are interested in, we want to take a look at the process with the FIDO key. So here I will click on register again, but this time I will use my USB security key. And if I click on that, you receive um, a message that says, hey, look, insert your security key and touch it. So if you do not touch it, of course, the signing request will not, uh, will not happen. So just to show you that, at the moment you receive the actual pop-up, you will see your key start blinking. So you see that red light? Simply touch it once and it stops blinking and you are good to go. And then for additional security purpose, instead of just having a key that you need to press, when you register a new uh, FIDO key, you will need to provide a PIN for that security key. So when registering a FIDO key, we put our FIDO key, we touch the FIDO key to sign the actual registration process. We then provide a PIN. And once we provided the PIN, we need to touch the security key again to confirm that registration process. So we touch our key twice during the registration process if you do use a PIN code. Next, as I mentioned, the authentication process. So we are now registered. We will now authenticate using our USB key. So we simply click on authenticate. We have our USB key already inside of our device. We provide the PIN code, and then of course, we touch our key to make sure that we want to sign that request. So again, the key will start blinking, touch it once, it stops blinking, and the authentication process is done successfully. We can see here, you are logged in successfully. So a very nice website that gives you a high level overview of what's going on and how the FIDO registration and authentication process works. If you want to know more in detail how it works, I highly recommend you to go to Ubico. Ubico is a nice website where you will find all the technical details regarding to the registration and authentication process. So to demonstrate you that, we will do exactly the same. 
but this time on the Ubico website and you will see all the information that we can gain from that website. So just as a kind small refresher, we have our security key that we put in. At the moment we want to register, we specify a device, in our case the USB key. We then receive a pop-up that say, hey look, you need to touch your security to guarantee you want to sign this request. So your security will, key will start blinking and say, hey look, touch me, touch me, touch me. You touch it and it will ask you a PIN code. PIN code sent, touch it again, you are done, you are registered. So we'll see that here. And once you're registered, you will find uh, all the information under show technical details. And that's really in an interesting one because you will see all the information regarding to your public key, the private key, what algorithms are being used, and most importantly, what key is being used. We can see, for instance, here that my key is a Thales key. Uh, we have all the information regarding to the manufacturer as well. And that's pretty interesting because in your organization, you will be able to use that to block certain manufacturers, to, to block certain protocols or to enforce certain algorithms as well. So that's pretty nice. If you do the same for the authentication process as well, you will see again all those details. So you will see the origin, the challenge, the relying party ID, the client ID, the key ID, the key handle, all those kind of details and all the metadata will be shown there. So I highly recommend you to test it out. And Call to action here again, even if you don't have a USB security key, you can use an other device for the passkey authentication method. So make sure to go to the Ubico website uh, if you want to know more about those technical details, of course. And then the last website I want to share with you here, that's the Thales um, demo site, where you are able to do the exact same process. So you are able to register and authenticate. So I will just show you the authentication process once again. So you see that uh, PIN code, you need to make sure that you touch your key to guarantee you are the one to, that want to sign that request. You touch the key once, the key starts blinking, and you are now registered. And that's really a nice one. Uh, yeah, you receive a little pop-up that says, are you sure you want to continue? But in, this is because it is a, a demo website. And that's a really interesting one. Here on this Starless website, when you log in, you will see the counter. So remember the counter that I talked about? So I register, counter went up one. So if I do log out now and I try to log in uh, for the first time, you will see that counter going upwards as well. So I try to log in, username, click on login, specify the key, touch the key. Once you have touched the key, you will need to write the pin code as well. So again, start blinking, touch it, provide your pin. And you need to touch it again to make sure you are the person you pretend to be. And that's it. And we can see here the counter now is went up to two. So that way we are sure that there is no clone being given by any other. Okay, so why should you choose FIDO2 in enterprise authentication? Well, hopefully it makes sense. It's really easy to use. Your users don't need to remember all those passwords. They don't need to type in those passwords as well. Because think about it, if you have a device with some spyware, your password is gone. If you have a bad protected server with your password stored, your password is gone. So FIDO, a really simple and of course, a very secure way to integrate it is, uh, provides very good security against many in the middle attacks. It's phishing resilient. And as we saw as well, if someone's tried to clone your security key, we have that counter in place to actually detect clones. And then it's very simple for IT uh, departments to actually manage it and deploying it. Uh, as we saw, the user can register uh, it, it very easily. So putting in the key, choosing a pin code, and that's it. And uh, if you have an EIM solution in place, an IDP solution, you can also um, integrate with your IDP. And that way, uh, what's interesting is that you will only have one username, one password stored and managed by your IDP, and then all the rest, your FIDO will be handled by the FIDO server, your relying party. So it's your time, guys. I just want to highlight here, FIDO keys can be, um, yeah, you can have one from our previous session. You might contact us to have a, a Thales key as well um, in the future if you forgot to um, request your in the last session. But please, if you have a FIDO key 
or if you have any form of passkey possibility, please make sure to enable it. You can it, enable it on different platforms, social media, your Google account, uh, all the Google services, by the way. You can enable it on GitHub. GitHub is typically something you want to protect as well because your code is actually stored there. Um, and if you are trying to integrate it with uh, Google, I just want to highlight that with Google, it is actually mandatory to have a second factor enabled first. So you need, of course, to have a Google account first, registration, username and password. You then secure that account a bit more using a second factor in case of you lose your key as a backup authentication method. And then you will be able to actually add your FIDO security key. So to add a USB passkey, you go to your settings. So in the browser, top right, go to settings. Then you go to privacy and security. You go to the security tab. And at the bottom, you look for add an USB security key. Another thing that I want to mention here is that I talked about that pin you need to use to actually protect your um, USB uh, FIDO key. Well, you can actually change that pin as well inside the settings of your browser. So you can see here, change the pin. I do provide the old pin. I provide the new pin. And then, of course, you need to touch your key to make sure that um, your FIDO key uh, allows the changement of that pin. And then, last but not least, once you have second factor authentication enabled, so you can see here, I use my um, my Android smartphone as well as uh, a backup uh, number. Uh, so I receive an OTP via SMS in worst case. And then the last step is, of course, to add your security USB key. And once you have done that, you simply have to use it. So here we can see that I'm actually logging in. I do need to provide my password. So keep in mind that it's not because you have your security key that your password totally disappears. It depends on how you implement it and how the service actually um, implements it as well. So we can see here, Google requires username and password, and then we, we are able to simply touch the USB key and we are good to go. So we don't need to actually provide an additional pin code in this, um, in this example. So just to show you, it all depends on the service you are using and uh, how secure you want to make it. So that's it. I see there is a question in the chat. If you have any questions, please feel free to add them in the chat. So I see a question from Lawrence. So what I would highly recommend here is the integration with an IDB. Um, IDB first. So once again, then you will have all your usernames and passwords stored locally, managed locally. If something once goes wrong, you block the user, you regenerate the password or you block the key. Uh, if you are using Okta or Thales, for instance, it's pretty easy to add uh, a FIDO key as well to a specific user. So that's perfectly possible. Step-by-step uh, guide, -step no, not really. But of course, there are some recommendations. Um, and again, if you have tools such as cloud platforms, uh, Google Clouds, GitHub, whatever, make sure that people that are having access to highly critical data or restricted data, make sure that they have uh, a FIDO key in place. You do not have to enroll it for everyone, but at least make sure that people that have access to highly critical data, that they have that FIDO key. Um, yeah, they have that FIDO key as seen through their accounts. Any other question? And I hope that uh, answered you the question. If it's not the case, uh, I will make sure to come back to your question, Lawrence. Okay, great. So guys, if there are any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, I will just provide you also uh, my email address as well as the email address of my colleague. So if you have any questions in the future, you want to see FIDO in action, you want to see FIDO integrated with one of your EIM or IDP solutions, well, again, make sure to contact us on one of those email addresses. So my colleague, Bart Reutz, and myself, Cédric de Vogelaar. And uh, if there are no more questions, I will finish the webinar here, five minutes before time. So that's pretty nice. I will wait five more minutes, but guys, you can go if you have no more questions. Thank you very much for joining us today. There will be a recording. So if you're interested um, to see the recording, please go to your YouTube channel. It will be published in one or two days. So again, if you have a question, make sure to contact us. And otherwise, I wish you a very good day.